Episode 5 of Percy Jackson is here, and as we've been doing every single week, I'm going to review it, break it down, point out hidden details and easter eggs, and then I'll rate it out of 10 and see how it compares to the other episodes we've gotten so far. Now there will be spoilers, so if you haven't seen episodes 1 to 5, spoiler warning. Before we start, I want to thank today's sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription that lets you choose a new designer fragrance every month for just $17. This makes it so you don't have to invest a lot of money on designer fragrances because Scentbird offers unisex options for brands like Gucci, Prada, and Versace, as well as some other indie labels like Skylar, Heretic, and Confessions of Rebel. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30-day supply so you can try out the fragrances before committing to a full-size bottle that can be pretty pricey. This month, I got scents from Commodity, Tommy Bahama, and Fleur. Fleur was my favorite for this month. It was made with jasmine dew, vanilla Madagascar, sandalwood, and a few other special ingredients as well. I wore it to my friend's wedding, lit up the dance floor, and now I'll always associate this incredible scent with this great night. Today I can give you guys a great discount of 55% off for your first month if you use my coupon code MOVIEFLAME55. It's just a little over $7 for your first month, which is a great deal for a great subscription available in the US and Canada. Thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video, and you can check out the links below. The episode is called A God Gives Us Cheeseburgers, which is taken right from the name of chapter 15 in the first novel. The episode starts with a beautiful point of view shot as Percy swims to the surface, and we see the St. Louis Arch with smoke coming out of the top where Percy just jumps, as well as a rescue helicopter. Then we have a wide shot from below the arch as Grover and Annabeth sit and wait with the police, and also the FBI according to this car. After that, we then see the three fates. I was so upset that they were cut from the first episode, because they were actually supposed to show up for the earlier events in the novel, but I'm so happy that they incorporated them here. Looking at them, we have Clotho the Spinner, Lachesis the Measurer, and Atropos the Unbending, who was the one who cut the string. I also think it's hilarious that they're all wearing different colored crocs to match their jumpsuits. The cutting of the string means that you or someone is going to die. Instead of Percy seeing it like in the book though, it's Annabeth that sees this, and she later says that this means one of them is going to die. It means one of us is going to die. We're all gonna die. Obviously, if you've read the books, you know what the cutting of the string really means, and it's a huge twist that we won't find out for a very long time if the show continues, but I'll leave it at that for spoiler sake. It's interesting that Grover's legs are out and being shown. In the book, he actively hid them with long pants, which always made me question, why do that if the mist will cover it anyway? And just from a technical standpoint, Disney actively choosing to have to do CGI for his legs in every shot is a questionable decision when it comes to the budget, but I respect the hell out of it because it shows true dedication. Grover is also wearing the red converse that are the flying shoes Luke gave to Percy, which Grover put on during episode 3. This is a small detail, but just the way Percy climbs over the railing after getting out of the water, and also the way he looks at them gives off perfect Percy vibes from the book, so well done by Walker Scobell. Hi. Walker is becoming my Percy from the books more and more as we go, and I'm absolutely loving it. One thing weird though is that he's soaking wet, while in the book, he actually can't get wet at all. He stays dry whenever he goes into the water. Maybe that's a power he'll get later on, I don't know. We get a nice Percy and Annabeth moment as she flings herself into hugging him, which really put a smile on my face. Then we just have Grover third wheeling. So. They skipped over Percy being told that they need to go to Santa Monica while underwater, which I'm fine with. I like that the last thing we saw of him in the water was him learning that he can breathe. Santa Monica is of course where Percy's epic fight with Ares takes place, which fans of the books have been anticipating so much, and that includes me. Grover mentions all the trouble they're in and how the cops are after them, which goes along with how Percy was a fugitive in the book, and that's literally the name of a chapter. I had a complaint earlier that we didn't see them blow the bus up in episode 3, but as Grover says, they instead crashed the train they were on. But honestly, that change is fine with me. I think that the train crashing is a good replacement for the bus being blown up. Percy mentions that Hades couldn't steal the Master Bolt. We're pretty sure Hades has the Master Bolt, but... He couldn't have stolen it himself. Which is true. As we found out in the book, a god is not allowed to steal another god's symbol of power. Percy says that his father saved him. He saved me. My dad. 
This goes along with that change they made in the last episode as his father willed the ocean to grab Percy out of the sky. As I said in my last video, this was a change that was needed because when writing the original book, Rick made a mistake thinking that the water was directly below the arch, which in real life it obviously wasn't. We finally get our introduction to Ares, the god of war, who was completely omitted from the movie adaptation, which was just so disappointing. So seeing him here makes a lot of fans, including myself, very happy. Adam Copeland is perfectly cast as Ares, both looks-wise with that strong jaw that matches up perfectly with the official depiction of him in Percy Jackson lore, and also from an acting standpoint, he really nailed the character. I think he feels it's just time for a war, so we're gonna have a war. Isn't that great? One thing I wish they added though was his sunglasses and the fire coming out from underneath them like the book described. They seem to be skipping over small things like that. We saw this in the last episode with them not having a kid in a snake tongue. I feel these are small things that would have gone a long way, but I'm just nitpicking at this point. I do love that they mentioned how Ares is Percy's cousin. As your big cousin. And this is true because he's the son of Hera and Zeus, and Zeus is the brother of Poseidon, who is of course the father of Percy. Hence, Percy and Ares are technically first cousins. Ares calls Annabeth wise because she's the daughter of Athena. You must be Athena's kid. Always gotta be the wisest one in the bunch. This also adds up because Athena is the goddess of wisdom. She's also known as the goddess of war, which I said in my last two videos and a bunch of people in the comments were saying that I was wrong about that, but a simple Google search will show that I'm actually right. The way Ares was introduced is a bit different than the book because there he actually shows up at the diner to meet them for the first time. But in the show, we meet him before that and he has them meet him at the diner. So the roles are sort of reversed. They go to a place called Wheels Diner, which is a real place right off the highway, but it's not in St. Louis, but rather in Canada, which is of course where the production took place. They filmed in Vancouver. The show gave Ares a smartphone, and he says that he's starting a fight on Twitter. Give me a second, I'm just starting a fight on Twitter here. This is actually interesting, because Ares is known for inciting wars, because after all, he's the god of war who gains more powers when wars are being fought. So to see him start a Twitter war is actually pretty hilarious, and definitely modernizes Percy Jackson, which was written almost 20 years ago at this point. This smartphone also shows us Gabe's interview, another thing that they modernized, because in the book, they actually saw the interview through the window of an appliance store, which is a very dated trope. This interview is hilarious. Gabe cracks me up in this show. I really, we really love that car <laughs> so much. <laughs> and I know a lot of people said that they don't like this Gabe because he's too likable. But for me, I think he's so funny that I can forgive that. I love that Annabeth stands up to Ares. If you're supposed to be looking for the master boat too, shouldn't you be out there looking for it? Mm. There's no fear in you, is there? It really shows how strong-willed she is, just like in the book. I also love the way they dropped Kronos' name, and also his backstory with Ares telling Percy how messed up their family is. My grandpa Kronos ate my aunts and uncles. Then my dad made him puke them back up, then chopped him into a million pieces and chucked him into a bottomless pit, so that kind of set the tone right out of the gate. And look at that, it's actually accurate to the book unlike the movie. The movie completely went against both the book's backstory of the gods and also just Greek mythology in general. Going back to the show though, we had a little twist as Ares says that he's keeping Grover as collateral, meaning that Percy and Annabeth go to the water park on their own. I actually like this change because it gives us more Percy and Annabeth scenes and it also shows Grover's bravery as he immediately says okay to this, not backing down. I'm gonna keep the satyr here as collateral so you don't run off. What, no. Okay. This also leads to some of the best scenes in the entire episode, but I'll touch on that in a minute. The water park they go to is called Waterland, which is taken straight from the book. When they walk in, you can see shell logos like the gas station, which makes me think that this set is a real water park that they just changed for the show, but don't quote me on that. Annabeth's saying she's never seen a movie. I've never seen any kind of movie. Never? What do you mean never? Like never, never? Was a bit odd at first, but the more I thought about it, I was like, Okay, yeah, that does make sense. Annabeth would of course always choose books over watching something, and she's been at Camp Half-Blood for most of her childhood where they have no TVs. I also accept this as a fact because of one reason, and that reason is that Rick Riordan, the author of the series, is a writer on the show, so that means that if the line is in there, he either approved it or wrote it himself. Also, this line perfectly sets up Percy basically asking Annabeth out on a movie date. Neither of us is dead in a few days. We really ought to fix that. 
we get the introduction to Celestial Bronze with the trap set here. That's Celestial Bronze. Oh, fascinating. Annabeth, what is happening right now? Celestial Bronze is what your sword is made of. And we even get the mention that that's what Percy's sword is made of. They still haven't told us that his sword is called Riptide though, which surprises me. We see Annabeth be fascinated by the machinery. Oh, look at that. That's cool. Annabeth! Which is another great trait that she has in the books, and is why she found Daedalus, the inventor of all kinds of machinery, so fascinating in the novels. Grover mentions that he met Ares on Olympus. We met at the solstice. On Olympus? This is a reference to the field trip that Camp Half-Blood took to visit Olympus during the winter solstice. And this is mentioned later on too. But that night, when everyone's kids show up for the winter solstice, and I have to sit through their presentation. The field trip will be an important plotline for future events, because as Grover says, one of the campers stole the Master Bolt that day since one of those kids somehow walked off with the Master Bolt. During this conversation, Grover lists some of the wars he's a fan of. I prefer the Turbot War. The Lobster War. The 335 Years War. The Turbot War was an international fishing dispute between Canada and Spain. The Lobster War was a dispute over spiny lobsters between Brazil and France. And the 335 Year War was a war that went on for so long because of a lack of a peace treaty. These all make total sense that Grover would like them, because they all either have to do with nature or they have to do with peace, both things that satyrs live by. The show also incorporated Thrill Ride O Love, which was another thing taken straight from the book. However, they changed the sequence quite a bit. They add the song, What is Love, which is pretty hilarious. And they show a dancing animation to give us Hephaestus' backstory, which is honestly a really creative way of giving us book information that might be hard to adapt. It sort of reminds me how Harry Potter adapted the tale of the three brothers. In the animation in the show though, we see Hephaestus be born from his mother Hera, who then threw him off Mount Olympus because of his lameness. And yes, that's an actual quote from Greek mythology lameness. The animation then shows him being a blacksmith, marrying the god of love Aphrodite, and Aphrodite being unfaithful to him, which she of course did with Ares, the person that sent them here. We then get the show extending Sally Jackson's role even more than they already have. The show of course added the fact that Sally told Percy stories of the gods, and now Percy comes to the realization that she was telling these stories to keep him away from the gods in Camp Half-Blood. She said this is what the gods are like to each other. This is the kind of family they are. Why didn't you want to say that just now? She was trying to keep me away from you guys. I'm actually a pretty big fan of this change, and so far, I've been loving what the show and, in turn, Rick has been adding to Sally Jackson's character. Having Rick on as a writer for the show, I think makes a lot of the changes hold much more weight than the changes in the movie did, because the movies went against Rick's wishes, while the show allows him to tell the story he wanted from the novel, and on top of that, change and add things that he wished he had done with the original book almost 20 years later. A lot of you were asking why I praised the show for changing things while I bashed the movies for doing the same thing, and that's why. It's because it's Rick's vision. And as I've been saying, the changes don't completely alter the plot like the films did. The changes in the show add to it while telling the same story the novels did. The show added a lot to this ride, as Percy and Annabeth jump into the water, and Percy uses his water powers to save them. To be honest though, I wish they showed this happening rather than just cutting to them being out of the water. That was pretty disappointing in my book. Where they find the shield is different from the book as well, because there they just found it in the boat next to them, while here it's in the trapped throne that Hephaestus made for his mother Hera. It was a gift, with a hidden purpose. Hephaestus offered it to Hera, but as soon as she sat in it, she couldn't get up. It's cool to see the show being able to add more Greek mythology to the series, because that story that Percy told was not in the book and is an actual Greek story, just like much of the lore in the novels. The obstacle to the shield is very different too, because in the book, they were attacked by a bunch of metal spiders, while in the show, they have to sit in the throne and sacrifice one of them. This also adds a new dynamic to their mission, and we get another back and forth between Percy and Annabeth, both arguing about who gets to give their life, perfectly playing off the stairwell scene on the arch, which was another piece that wasn't in the original book. This back and forth showed some incredible acting from Scobell and Jeffries. I was super impressed. And during this, Annabeth calls Percy seaweed brain. This isn't the arch seaweed brain. The nickname she gave him in the first book and that stuck for years to come, even when they started dating many years later. This scene also adds a ton to Percy and Annabeth's relationship that was not in the book. I was gonna say when this quest is done, can you? Maybe swing back here and try to get me out of this thing. You think you had to ask? It reminds me a lot of what the Harry Potter movies did with Ron and Hermione, adding little things here and there that weren't in the book and that hinted at them being together. The CGI for the throne engulfing Percy looked really, really good. 
I also did not expect to see Hephaestus himself. I love the instrument they gave him. That was a nice addition as well. His back and forth with Annabeth was also really interesting as she actually praises Percy for his good nature and talks badly about the gods. This is a theme we've seen in the show, the gods being painted in a bad light, which is something that the books would eventually touch on, but certainly not this early. But hey, I'm here for it being in the first season. Ares says that he hates his kids. I hate my own kids. This refers to Clarice and the Ares cabin. This adds up to how he feels about her in the next book, and I think this will play out further next season when Clarice is highlighted a bit more. This back and forth between Ares and Grover is also a really interesting dynamic that I did not expect, but I'm pleasantly surprised by how much I like it. I think these are actually my favorite scenes in the episode, and it has Rick Riordan writing all over it. Especially when they discuss Ares' sister Athena and how she talks to her owl. She's the smart one? Really? If she's so smart, explain the owl. She talks to it, like, all the time, this fat, nasty little feathered rodent. And it's like her best friend. And we're so sure that she's a genius and I, no owl, am not. This is truly a great bit of dialogue that made me laugh pretty hard. Grover also mentions the lightning thief here, and their conversation here is very interesting as well. You being the one to find the lightning thief and not her. We both know your friend didn't steal the bolt. Yeah. But Zeus thinks he did. Which is kind of all that matters, right? Shut up. Also, with the mention of the Lightning Thief, that is the name of the first novel that Season 1 is based on. They're able to return the shield to Ares, and by the way, I love the boar the shield has on it, especially with the scar across its eye. Ares provides them with a ride, and just like in the book, it's in the back of a truck called Kindness International, which is a truck filled with zoo animals going to Vegas. We get a mention of the Lotus Casino, but in a few hours, this thing is going to be at the Lotus Casino in Vegas, which is a big plot point coming up, and is a place that plays a big part in the books overall. All. Ares also says that Hermes hangs out there. Hermes hangs out there. Which is a big change from the book because there, Hermes was not present for that scene. So I'm excited to see what they do with that. Ares also throws Percy a backpack, which is another important plot line that will play out later. But I'll leave it at that for now because, again, spoilers. I loved how Percy stepped up to Ares. This matches up with the book perfectly because whenever Percy was around the god of war, he would get frustrated or angry simply because Ares was in his presence. That was the effect the god of war had on people and especially on Percy. This standoff also sets up their fight that we'll see later on in the season and it does a great job of getting me even more hype for that scene. Grover also had two hilarious lines, first when thanking Ares. Thank you for the emotional abuse and the cheeseburgers. And then when he asked for paper towels. Hey, do you think we could get some paper towels or something? It's not that nice in here. The episode ends with Grover saying he knows who stole the Master Bolt. I know who stole the Master Bolt. Which he figured out from his conversation with Ares, and both that conversation and Grover saying this final line was not in the novel. And it definitely leaves both non-book readers and book readers on a great cliffhanger, because we don't know what Grover's gonna say either. So my overall thoughts on the episode and my rating out of 10. I'm happy to say, this is my favorite episode so far. I really don't think there's much to complain about other than not seeing Percy save himself and Annabeth when they jumped into the water. And even there, we did see Percy use his powers for a brief second, so I can forgive that. Then the only other small thing was not seeing Ares have his fire eyes, but that's just nitpicking, so that doesn't even count. I think the main three are becoming more and more like their book counterparts, and it's actually incredible to see. With every episode, they have gotten better and better with their acting, and every line I hear come out of Walker Scobell's mouth. I'm like, yes, that right there, that is Percy Jackson. And the same goes for Annabeth and Grover. Grover was honestly a highlight for me in this episode, which I love because as I said in the first two episodes, I didn't really care for him there. Since then though, he has done nothing but made me fall in love with him and the actor playing him. This episode continues to do what previous episodes did, and that is painting the gods in a bad light. In this specific episode though, it talks about how messed up the gods are, first with Ares' line when talking about Kronos. Olympians fight. We betray, we backstab, we will push anyone down a flight of stairs to get ahead. And that's why I love my family so much. Then with Percy's mother not wanting him to join them. She said this is what the gods are like to each other. Then with Hephaestus' story, and then with Annabeth and Hephaestus' conversation. Eat or be eaten, power and glory and nothing else matters. Ares is that way, Zeus is that way, my mother is that way. I find this super interesting, and it kind of digs into Rick Riordan's spin-off book, which was a book narrated by Percy as he just talks about the gods, their backstories, and as the episode talks about, how messed up they are. Now, my rating out of 10. 
I'm going to give this episode a 9 out of 10, which ranks it higher than any other episode so far in my opinion. That's my rating though, let me know what your rating is, and let me know your thoughts on the episode, and also just the show as a whole. Start some conversations, reply to people, and I might even jump in to give my two cents as well. I want to again thank Scentbird for sponsoring this video. Again, if you use the links down below, you get a 55% discount using my discount code MOVIEFLAME55. That's all I have for you guys today though, so I will see you for next week's episode. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life like my cute dog Loki and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.